going to start the podcast. Three, two, one, start. Ok. Olá. Uh, 
Hello, Sigita. SG, we are waiting uh, for Minister Hadzidakis to join. He should be joining now. He, I think he's online already. So whenever you are ready, we can start. So when do we start? Um, let's welcome everyone to, to this um, event on understanding the gender and environment nexus. Um, this is uh, an event to launch the OECD report on gender and the environment, building evidence and policies to achieve the SDGs. Um, I'll pass the floor straight to our uh, Secretary General uh, OECD, uh, for TV, Angel Guria. Uh, dear SG, the, the floor is yours, please. Uh, well, um, thank you very much. Uh, and uh, Minister Hatsidakis and uh, dear friends, uh, I am delighted to launch the OECD report. This is gender and the environment, building the evidence base and advancing policy action to achieve the SDGs. So it's a long title, but it describes exactly uh, what it wants to do. Uh, so gender and the environment, and then the subtitle uh, of building the evidence base and advancing policy action to achieve the SDGs. I'd like to first thank the government of Greece for their generous support in advancing this work. Now, we face a mounting set of interconnected global emergencies, health, environment, socioeconomic. Yet, our approaches to these problems are often siloed, fragmented, inadequate. Our policies in addressing climate change is a good example. Today, it is pretty clear that the impacts of climate change are not gender neutral. In developing and advanced economies alike, women are more vulnerable to environmental impact than men. And this is due to the interplay of uneven access to resources, to cultural norms, and to entrenched social structures. For example, women tend to be overrepresented in low income groups, which are most affected by pollution in cities and environmental damage from industry. So, now, lower access to finance, lower access to education, increases their economic vulnerability and constrains their ability to prepare for and respond to environmental shocks. Furthermore, studies show that disasters caused by natural hazards increase the triggers for violence against women, compounding women's health consequences. So if we are to emerge stronger from the COVID-19 crisis, our policies need to account for these differential impacts of environmental factors on men and women. Until now, gender equality has been a missing part in most of our climate solutions. And we need to fix this. We need to address it. The 2021 edition of the OECD's Going for Growth, which we published uh, very recently, advocates coupling policies aimed at building resilience and long-term sustainability with those aimed at supporting vulnerable groups during transitions. These synergies between policies are critical. So we need to better understand the complex relationship between the green transition and gender equality. For instance, data from the EU indicates that um, women prefer working in the renewable part 
of the energy sector, despite only representing 32% of its workforce. Now, there is a, a pitfall here. Many green jobs in sustainable infrastructure, renewable energy, low carbon manufacturing, uh, green construction are STEM intensive. That means they need science, technology, engineering, and mathematical knowledge. Given that only 32% of the OECD bachelor graduates in STEM are women, you know, arithmetically, we know we will not achieve an inclusive path to a net zero future without a concrete policy to address the gender gap in STEM education. So this is the kind of um, policy example, you know, the kind of, of uh, very practical down-to-earth issues that we have to deal with when you, you change policies. But to implement changes in policies, we need to level uh, any uneven power dynamics. And women and girls are boldly leading on climate justice. Yet at the political level, they only represent 30% of climate negotiators. So their perspectives in disaster management are also not adequately considered not adequately met despite the Sendai framework for disaster risk reduction. Now the COVID-19 pandemic is giving us a unique opportunity to do this differently. More than an opportunity, we have a responsibility to integrate gender and environmental considerations into our national recovery plans, because these will define the type of societies we want to build in the coming decades. Now, let me highlight three central recommendations from our report. First, more must be done to support countries in systemically integrating gender analysis into data collection efforts. Only by doing this can governments and businesses define their strategies and define their projects in a more gender sensitive way. So, Neil, you know the old story. If you cannot measure it, you cannot manage it. So we need to have the information. Second, there is potential to better utilize existing and new resources when the cross-cutting objectives of gender equality and tackling climate change are both integrated into development cooperation policy. Both. Only 57% of climate-related bilateral aid, you know, we're talking about the, um, the ODA part that is dedicated to um, climate or that is climate related. Only 57% of climate related bilateral aid implemented between 2008, 2019, 2018, 2019. So in that two year, two year period, either integrated or targeted gender equality. That means we have a full 42% that did not do that. They did not integrate gender equality. So there is a significant scope to boost gender mainstreaming in developing, uh, in development cooperation programs. A lot of work to do there. Now third, while promoting the transition to greener economies, governments should invest more in skills training, and more generally, in easing access to quality jobs 
and broad-based social safety nets. Combining income assistance during transitions with incentives for learning and also access to work. In the end, this is the definitive solution, access to work. So dear friends, overcoming gender inequality is a cornerstone of climate resilient development. Improvements in this sector will have far reaching consequences, far reaching benefits for adaptation and for mitigation. Together, we can make the gender environment nexus a force, a force for transforming our economies, a force for transforming our societies so that they can be more resilient, more inclusive, and more sustainable. Thank you. Thank you, Secretary, for your introduction. Let me now pass the floor to Minister Kostis Hatzidakis from Greece, who is the Minister for Labor and Social Affairs and also responsible for gender equality. Minister, the floor is yours. Thank you. Secretary General of the OECD, dear Mr. Guria, ambassadors, ladies and gentlemen, it is a great honor to be uh, here with you today, albeit virtually, and share with you my insights on the gender environment nexus. Both topics, environmental sustainability and gender equality are close to my heart. Having held the position of the Greek Minister for Environment until 2020, and currently being the Minister of Labor and Social Affairs, overseeing also gender equality. During my tenure as at the Ministry of Environment and Energy, tackling climate change was at the top of our agenda. For example, we made the historic, I would say, commitment to decommission all operating lignite units of the country by 2023. The OECD report launched today reminds us though that we also need to examine the differential impact of climate change in terms of gender. Because climate change affects men and women differently given existing discrimination and their differential access to resources. This reality highlights the need for gender equality and environmental sustainability to be at the core of the recovery measures introduced by governments. It is a truth reflected in the fact that the green and inclusive elements are key in the RRF, the Recovery and Resilience Fund of the European Union. The Greek Ministry of Labor is already very active in combating gender inequalities and supporting women's economic empowerment. Just to mention an example, the new labor legislation, the new labor reform currently on public consultation actively tackles disincentives to hiring women. Our initiatives are part of a broader effort within the recovery and resilience plan as submitted to the European Commission. And women's participation in green growth is among the activities that we are, we are planning to fund uh, using its resources. Along with a major reform in the area of skills, because Greece is lagging behind 
uh, as regards this sector, over 1 billion euros for skills training, and an additional uh, four, uh, uh, excuse me, 540 million euros for employment programs via subsidized fixed term positions. Particular focus will be placed on digital and green skills with certain programs targeted specifically at women. One of our proposed programs within our recovery and resilience plan is the Green Jobs Initiatives, initiative, which aims to support the transition to a green economy by subsidizing the creation of 5,000 new jobs at businesses that are either already operating in or are shifting their business model toward the green sector with an emphasis on unemployed women. Regarding the participation of women in green growth, we are lucky to also count on the crucial support of the OECD. And that is why I would like to formally salute the project between the Greek Ministry of Labor and OECD on empowering women in the transition towards green growth. The upcoming end of the pandemic, as we all hope, coupled uh, with the funds of the Recovery and Resilience Plan, present a unique opportunity to enhance women's participation in environment-related economic activities. We are determined to use it. On a personal note, before closing my speech, I want to say a big thank, a big thank you to Secretary General Guria for all his work at the OECD for the past 15 years. I have worked with him as uh, Minister of uh, Development and Investments uh, in the past. And I always admire his commitment to green and inclusive growth, to international cooperation, to working together. Dear Mr. Guria, I wish you all the best for your next steps. All the best. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Hazidakis. Thank you for your uh, intervention. Um, may I now pass the floor to Sigita Stumspeter, uh, the head of the Sustainable Development, Gender and Partnerships team here at the OECD Environment Director to give us a short presentation of the, um, of the report that was just published. Sigita, the floor is yours. Thank you, Dimitra. Uh, thank you, the Secretary General, Minister. Um, I'm, I'm just asking Neve uh, if, if the slides are being shared. So it's my pleasure to take you through some of the main findings of uh, this publication and to pinpoint to key areas for further research. But let me thank first those who made this publication possible, starting with the delegates of the OECD Environment Policy Committee who provided their support on the topic and engaged in a questionnaire which supported the research. I also want to thank our director, Rudolfo Lassi, my co-authors, Dimitra Xinu, Sara Ramos Magania, Romina Borini, with whom we work closely on the first draft of the report, and also Naoko Kawaguchi for her tremendous support from the Office of the Secretary General, and of course, uh, many others. Uh, so the, the next slide, please. So to start, let's recall the key premise of this work, uh, which is grounded on the notion that the gender equality and environmental goals are intertwined. 
women and men often live environmental impacts differently, which was already mentioned earlier. So sometimes this is because of gender differences in socioeconomic uh, status, inter intersectionality factors, such as belonging to migrant or indigenous communities or being a single parent. Some impacts may be related to physiological differences. For example, some studies uh, link pregnant women's exposure to air pollutants with uh, negative effects on fetus, increasing the probability of pregnancy loss of uh, up to 16%. Other factors may be related to social roles and responsibilities. Um, so the publication highlights many such cases from developing countries where women play the role of uh, food, water, and energy providers for their households, uh, while environmental degradation makes these responsibilities uh, challenging. Uh, the flip side of this coin uh, is that uh, gender gaps hamper the achievement of environmental goals. So many surveys show that women have greener attitudes in their personal choices, and they are willing to contribute more to the transition to a low carbon economy as consumers, employees, and decision makers. But ingrained uh, gender inequalities mean that in practice, their contribution uh, to achieving environmental goals is um, um, diminished. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so um, the, the, the main value added of this publication, also it was mentioned before that it looks an, into interlinkages. Um, it, it comes, um, which come uh, at looking systematically uh, at different approaches uh, to integrate uh, the, the gender equality with the environmental using the SDG classification but also uh, existing relevant OECD policy frameworks and bring together available evidence on the topic from both OECD and developing countries, which was also um, often uh, looked at on separate tracks. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so the publication zooms in on uh, nine SDGs. Uh, sorry, I think this is the wrong slide. Um, yeah, yeah, that was the one before. Yeah, at the nine SDGs uh, that have a strong environmental component. These include the five planet goals, but also three prosperity goals and one people goal. So of course, other SDGs also have implications for the nexus, but the selected ones are most telling. Uh, next slide, please. So this chart shows the weak link we identified in the SDG framework. While the people SDGs obviously have many, many gender related indicators in the sense that the text of the indicator refers to gender or the indicator allows for gender disaggregation. This is hardly the case for the five uh, planet goals as, as we can see it's uh, almost non-existing. Okay, um, next slide. So in fact, our um, analysis has identified that out of the 231 unique SDG indicators, there are 247 in total, but some are duplicated, uh, meaning that the same indicator appears in different goals. Only 20 of those that are environment related can be disaggregated by gender because the text refer to gender. So the table to the left shows you the specific list of indicators. In the publication, we identify a list of over 60 additional environment-related indicators that should be gender disaggregated. For instance, achieving SDG 9 would require a transformation in production processes, especially for energy-intensive industries and economic activities. Such transformation is uh, rarely gender neutral due to existing gender divide in the labor force in these sectors, for example, manufacturing and transport. Moreover, often lack of sustainable infrastructure, um, especially in rural areas affects women the most as they have less access to resources uh, to support their well-being. Promoting inclusive and sustainable industrialization with a gender perspective, which is target 9.2, and supporting women entrepreneurs who are more than not 
um, are excluded from access to credit, which is target 9.3, could set the ground for a truly sustainable uh, growth path. Uh, encouraging women's further participation in eco innovation, which is target uh, 9.5, and in high tech industries, um, indicator 9.b, by tackling barriers to their participation in STEM subjects or in senior management positions, could lead to better diversity, wider technological breadth, and more economically valuable research uh, results. More sustainable infrastructure to support such efforts could enhance women's further participation um, in economic and other activities without negatively affecting uh, their local environment on which, especially in developing countries, they are often dependent. So it's target 9.4 and indicators 9.8 uh, and uh, 9.C. Uh, next slide. So the second issue that we found in this publication uh, in analyzing the nexus and uh, developing suitable policies is that not only the indicators have not been identified thoroughly, but that the data itself is rarely available. So this chart shows that uh, gender disaggregated data collected is weakest in environmental protection as opposed to um, other social questions. Uh, our recent survey conducted through the OECD Environment Policy Committee confirmed this massive deficit in data gathering. And clearly, as the, the Secretary General mentioned, without data, it is difficult to raise awareness, assess problems, and uh, find solutions. Next slide. So um, the report also has a chapter dedicated to the economic implications of the Nexus. The main message is that the green transition is a unique opportunity to bring more women um, into labor force and give them access to higher paid jobs. Unlike brown industries, which are dominated by men, as shown in the chart, greener industries tend to have more women. For instance, a global sur survey conducted in 2018 by um, International Renewable Energy Agency shows that women account for 32% of the wor workforce in the renewable energy sector compared to only 22 in, uh, in oil and gas industries. However, even in the renewable energy, only 20% of the STEM related roles are occupied by women compared to half of administrative positions and 35% of non-science technology, engineering, mathematics, uh, technical roles. Again, family responsibilities, formal and informal barriers to employment, discrimination challenges, such as access to STEM, influence heavily on uh, women's participation in this sector. So this is uh, one of key areas for, for further work. Uh, next slide. Okay, so finally, let me highlight the policy approach taken in this publication to analyze the nexus which is based on three types of policies and their interactions we should be looking at. So one is uh, gender equality po policies, which is, uh, well, as mentioned before, countries often look in silos. Then there are domestic environment related policies, again, sometimes looked in silos, and finally, transboundary policies. So effectively, all policies are relevant to the nexus, and uh, the key is uh, understanding the trade-offs and complementarities. And luckily, in the case of this uh, nexus, we are mainly talking about complementarities. So um, thank you for your attention. And now we can turn to panel to elaborate more on these questions. Thank you, Sikita. Um, may I now pass the floor to Romina Boarini? who is the director of the OECD Center for Wellbeing, Inclusion, Sustainability, and Equal Opportunity. She will be moderating our uh, expert panel discussion. Romina, please. Thank you, and uh, good morning all. It's a pleasure to be with you uh, for uh, the launch of this very important uh, publication. Uh, so we have today a fantastic panel that is going to discuss some of the main uh, findings from this report. And even more importantly, the panel is going to share some experiences uh, around the policies that work to really sort of foster in a very positive manner uh, the nexus between uh, gender and the environment. 
uh, before I give them the floor, uh, let me just highlight, as, as it was uh, said by our eminent uh, speakers before, that uh, we only have uh, less than a decade to reach SDGs. And we know that the progress that needs to be accomplished by all of us, countries, governments, and all actors in the society is huge. Uh, as concerns SDG number five, we know that despite progress, discrimination is still limiting women's rights and opportunities in both private and public spheres. Even in the OECD area, uh, no country actually has a comprehensive legal framework that promotes gender e equality, and no uh, country reached a equal representation, a higher level of decision making. I think that we heard uh, in the words of our Secretary General also how low is still the gender representation and, and the women's representations in decisions that specifically relate to the environment and to climate change. And uh, of course, even if over time uh, progress uh, has been observed in a few areas, we still have uh, quite, uh, quite a number of challenges when it comes to data and statistics. And uh, Sigita was highlighting that and you know, some of the very specific uh, findings, in fact, that looked at the availability of uh, and environmental and, and climate related uh, targets and, and goals uh, disaggregated by uh, gender, uh, we know that uh, really we frankly not there. So much, much more need to uh, happen, I think at the fundamental level uh, in, in terms of building those statistics and the situation uh, is obviously uh, much more challenges in, in non-OECD countries. And uh, the COVID uh, has not helped because we know that for many women, in fact, the pandemic has certainly uh, created additional problems. But as he also was saying, we have a number of opportunities here. So the building back better. Uh, in the OECD, we are working to help all countries uh, really uh, building forward. We are preparing a dashboard that looks at what countries are doing uh, to build back better, you know, the recovery plans. And within that, of course, we are insisting very much on the specific role of women. So gender is certainly one of the dimensions that is going to be ma mainstream in this approach. Uh, we also have uh, the IPAD program, I'm sure that we hear a little bit more about it. And more generally speaking, of course, the green transition is really opening up a number of opportunities. So with that, let me introduce uh, the uh, very, uh, very distinguished panelists that we have uh, with us today for, uh, for this panel. So uh, I'm pleased to uh, be joined uh, today by... Um, uh, first of all, uh, Chitra Kumar, who is the Associate Director uh, from the Office of Environmental Justice from the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency. Uh, uh, I'm also joined by Linda Gustafsson. She is the Gender Equality Advisor, uh, City of Ulmea in Sweden. Uh, we are also joined by Mapula Changela, who is the Director for Climate Change Mitigation Plans Implementations from the National Department of Environment, Forestry and Fisheries in South Africa. Uh, we will also have Josephine Muzango, Professor, Jens Trilateral Research Chair Order from the School of Public Leadership uh, in, South, uh, in South Africa. Uh, we will then uh, hear uh, from Verania Chow, who is the program specialist, gender and climate uh, change uh, from the UNDP, and last but certainly not least, our uh, director of the environment, uh, uh, Mrs. Rudolf Lassie. So uh, uh, please, panelists, uh, you all have three minutes for your initial uh, high-level intervention. Uh, and uh, we will hopefully also have uh, a short round of questions. We have a number of participants. Uh, in fact, I see that we are close to 180 participants. I think that that really speaks to the importance of this event today. So we will hopefully uh, be able to engage a very entire an interactive conversation and dialogue uh, with the floor after your interventions. So with that, let me uh, immediately give the floor to the first of our panelists. Uh, this is Chitra Kumar, uh, Associate Director uh, from the US uh, EPA. Uh, pleased to take the floor. Um, uh, Chitra, you are responsible for uh, the federal interagency partnerships, strategic communication, and you're supporting uh, the White House uh, initiatives. Uh, please, Chitra, close is yours for your remarks. Thank you so much for having me on this esteemed panel. So over 50 years ago, the US EPA was established to provide clean environment and safe health to everyone in the United States. And many of the leaders who fought for those protections were women. 
the President Biden and Harris administration recognizes that while gains have been made, they have been uneven across demographic groups for a variety of systemic reasons, and they've put their firm support behind addressing injustices. Environmental justice is the fair treatment and meaningful involvement of all people. And we in the US recognize that, we'll, that we cannot realize that mission without acknowledging the reality that women were and are being left behind when it comes to decisions about their health and the environment. Our new head of the EPA, Administrator Michael Regan, has made it clear that environmental justice is not something we should address, it's something we must address. Environmental justice is the first and fundamentally important issue to create equal access to resources and to correct for past injustices. We all benefit from strong EJ policies and actions, especially women who often bear the burden of meeting the basic needs of communities, whether it's sanitation and hygiene to protect against COVID-19 exposure, or making sure that children have asthma inhalers in urban neighborhoods with high concentrations of air pollution. One of the most important interventions we see is strong executive leadership that is taking a whole of government approach to shift existing programs like EPA's regulating sources of pollution and providing funding to deal with climate change alongside structural inequities. Within days in office, President Biden signed executive orders on addressing climate change and advancing racial equity to su in supporting underserved communities. The administration also set up a White House Gender Policy Council, which EPA Administrator Regan sits on. What's more, several formal methods to meaningfully involve key stakeholders have been baked in. Women in the EJ movement have long been the force that has driven progress. So it's not surprising that almost two thirds of the members of two highly visible formal federal advisory committees, both sanctioned to provide consensus recommendations to the federal government are women. The two are the White House Environmental Justice Advisory Council established under an executive order on climate change and environmental justice and EPA's own National Environmental Justice Advisory Council. Titans like Peggy Shepard have been pushed the agency forward and we're pleased that she too is now serving on the White House Environmental Justice Advisory Council, prompting the entire US government forward. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Chidra, for sharing with us this very, uh, you know, very, very uh, good news. And it's great that, you know, the leadership in APA is now mainstreaming this vision of, of really environmental justice that's certainly key to achieve uh, progress on a number of fronts. Let, let me now give uh, the floor to the next speaker, who is Linda Gustenson, Gender Equality Advisor from the city of Umea. Uh, uh, Linda, you have 15 years of experience in working on with gender equality on local, region, and national level. And uh, you are appointed to the Swedish Government Advisory Board on Feminist Urban Planning. So I think we are all looking forward to hear from you, your very concrete experience in designing and implementing uh, you know, gender policies at local level, and of course, the interactions with gender, uh, with climate and the environment. Linda, floor is yours. Thank you, and thank you for inviting me to this important panel. I am the gender advisor for the city of Umeå, so I am a representative from the, from the local level. Umeå is a city that is located in the northern part of Sweden, uh, and it's a city that for more than 30 years has strived for gender equality, and we call our method of work the gender landscape. It's a method that we use when we plan and build and think about our city, from the political level to the everyday work of the public services. It's about integrating an understanding of gendered power structures and life conditions of women and men in all the work that the municipality does and in all policy areas. And we do that through gender segregated data, through surveys, through analysis, and not least dialogue, trying our very best to understand the different life conditions of the inhabitants of the city so that we can create better services and hopefully also plan and build a city that in itself is norm critical and creates conditions for women and men to have equal power to shape society as well as their own lives and create equal opportunity. 
we try to create this understanding that we all live in a gendered landscape and it's about getting that lens in your eye and understanding how it takes form in our city. This is also why we have our gendered landscape bus tour where we exemplify successful changes. We notice the structure of the city and highlight remaining challenges. Why is it, for example, so easy to take the bus to female dominated workplaces and so hard to take the bus to male dominated workplaces? Why are there so many places in the city that encourage physical movement for young people, but so few that offer a high quality hangout, something that young women say that they want? Umeå is also one of nine Swedish cities that have signed the first climate city contracts with the Swedish government. And it follows the same methodology as the mission for 100 climate neutral cities in Europe. And it states by and for citizens, not by, by and for some of the citizens. So co-creation and working together are key elements. And Umeå is a city that keeps highlighting the importance of integrating an understanding of gender inequality as a central part of the work so, so to make sure it really becomes by and for the citizens. Because it's when we make sure that everyone is part of the conversation that it becomes not only fair, but when the truly innovative ideas also will take form. And a holistic understanding of sustainability is a guiding principle for all strategic development in Umeå and gender equality is understood as a fundamental, fundamental component of sustainability. And we also we have an organization that has trained itself in seeing that behavioral change is not easy and that it's connected to power, to identity and norms. And to highlight that and work with that is just as important as introducing new technology. So finally, we believe that for us, gender equality work needs to be globally understood, but also locally contextualized and that working actively with gender equality, quantitative and qualitative, is in all aspects a good investment. It makes us have a critical eye, it opens up processes and creates innovation, but it can also save a lot of money and time by making interventions specific and efficient. But it cannot be an afterthought, it needs to be there from the start. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Linda. I think it's uh... Super interesting to hear uh, the methodology of the gendered landscape that you just presented to us, and I think this is very, very, very concrete and and certainly the message around you know involving uh, citizens in, in defining those plans is I'm sure something that uh, uh, that many other countries are, are also sort of following with with a lot of interest. We'll come back to some of your points you made. Very interesting around transport and uh, you know mobility, thinking of that you know really from in a gender sensitive perspective. But now let me give the floor. To our next uh, panelist, who is Mrs. Manu, uh, Manupala, Mapula, sorry, Sanglea. Uh, she is the director for climate change mitigation plans implementations uh, in the National Department of Environment, Forestry and Fishery in South Africa. And uh, uh, Mapula, you were previously the senior policy advisor on national sustainable development, and you, uh, in that capacity, were part of the team that managed several initiatives, including national strategy. For sustainable development so you have really a very significant experience uh, to share with us today on those issues please uh, i give you the floor now um thank you so much um program director um so i am honored to be part of this launch today um but firstly i also send greetings to all that is present here i acknowledge and observe all protocols to everyone that is here it is indeed a very important launch today. Um, so I'll try to share from our perspective uh, in practice, the policy efforts that we've been doing as the environment sector in mainstreaming uh, gender uh, and the environment. As you would have recognized in the earlier slides, um, SDGs have got interactions. We can take the whole two weeks just talking about mainstreaming into all the SDGs. Uh, but I'll try to reflect more from the ministry that I come from, what are we doing to mainstream and the role that we're playing to facilitate and steer um, the mainstreaming of gender. So there's two aspects. The one aspect, of course, is on mainstreaming into the policies uh, of the department itself, but also of the sector as people who are leading uh, and co-leading with the sector. But how we do uh, develop those policies, we have a co-creation approach. And that is why I'm also here today with my colleagues, Professor Josephine uh, Musango, because most of the time as the ministry, we try to work with researchers to generate evidence that is relevant for policy. 
Um, so having said that also, um, one of the slides reflect of the report reflected around mainstreaming in decision-making. So what I can share, for example, is that in our ministry, um, we have about 43% of us as senior managers in the department, which is about 70 of the 164 members of the executive in the ministry is it's, it's women. Um, so there is an element of uh, representation within the ministry itself. The second aspect is now the work we're doing for the sector. Uh, we have programs such as the Working for Water, Working for Land, Wetlands, Fire, Oceans, Waste, Climate. So all those SDGs, we've got the Working for programs. And, and what is key about the model we have is that um, it works with unemployed members of society, but it also works with um, the, the private sector that is also representative. So there are indicators we look at in terms of the, the project implementers who are in from the, from the private sector, but making sure that 50% to 60% are women-led uh, uh, organizations, but even the participants themselves, they are supposed to be 60% uh, women, just to give specific figures, for example, 38,670 uh, work opportunities were created that benefit that whose participation was from women. Uh, and that is about 53% uh, of the work opportunities that were created. But just briefly to share, what does it translate to the participation of those women uh, in that program is that, for example, uh, in just 2019 and 2020 uh, financial year, uh, 124 wetlands were rehabilitated under that program. 3,475 hectares of land were under restoration. Uh, 1,800 kilometers of coastlines were cleaned. Uh, 1,852 wildlife fires were suppressed. Uh, but also lastly, 93,000 uh, hectares of invasive species were also treated under that program. So this is just to demonstrate what we are doing in poly within the department, but also within the sector uh, in terms of uh, conservation and rehabilitation program. But as I indicated, of course, uh, uh, environment mandate is now even more complex. It's not only about conversation, and conservation, but also there's climate and there's energy and there's transport. And I'll be very keen to look at uh, what the report is saying in that aspect. But some of the challenges, of course, we're still having uh, with COVID that has emerged is an emerging issue. Uh, the, the, the challenges to the researchers is how soon can we then get the evidence that can assist in policy making as we do uh, recovery plans in that aspect. Thank you so much. I'm looking forward to hearing more on the report. Thanks. Thank you, Mapula. I think this, this was very, very interesting. Uh, you know, your final point around whether the COVID, in a way, uh, you know, uh, provided, uh, you know, a sort of a hard stop to, to the efforts of many countries, or if the country, you know, uh, perhaps uh, accelerated the urgency, but what we certainly see the challenges you're mentioning. And uh, the, the very concrete figures, I think, are, are quite. Uh, uh, you know, give, gives us uh, a lot of hope uh, in terms, indeed, of, of really the huge impact that those programs uh, for conservation uh, can have in terms of, of gender inclusion and and uh, and gender equality. But as you said, there are certainly you know the the, the other opportunities on transport that uh, that uh, can be also sized uh, in uh, in uh, in the next few years. But uh, thanks so much for sharing. I think this is. Uh, very concrete, and we, we're happy to see that th this approach is already working uh, very, very, uh, very, very concretely, actually, to illustrate what we were talking about, you know, the complementarities between the two objectives of, of protecting the environment and, uh, of course, uh, reaching gender equality. Let me now give the floor to the next speaker, uh, Professor jo Josephine Muzango. Uh, she is a professor at the School of Public Leadership in, uh, in the Stellenbosch University in uh, South Africa. And indeed, I understand that, uh, uh, Josephine, you work with Mapula, so your presentation is going to complement very much that of uh, Mapula. Uh, you're going to uh, talk more about the energy uh, security issues in former settlements. So, Josephine, the floor is yours. Thank you, Chair, and I'm very excited uh, to be part of this uh, distinguished panel. 
um, mainstreaming gender for energy security in poor urban environments. In short, GENS, it is a research chair, which is within Stellenbosch University in South Africa, in collaboration with Brunei University London in the UK and the University of Nairobi in Kenya. Uh, the GENS trilateral chair is purposely uh, established in 2019 with a, the purpose of exploring opportunities for gendered energy innovations. And what we mean by gendered energy innovations is innovations that take into account of different roles of men and women and they also their needs in addressing energy insecurity. And as Mapula has already highlighted, we are aiming at providing evidence-based solutions which are gendered in collaboration with a community, with industry and policy. And we are having two case studies, one in South Africa and one in, 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 in Kenya. So we are working with community and policymakers to co-research, co-design and co-learn together. And what I'm going to present today is the emerging evidence-based data and information that we are gaining from the research that we are doing and also in collaboration of the workshop that we held uh, in March this year, uh, where we had policymakers, uh, researchers, industry, and the community members as part of the workshop. Uh, so the first uh, key uh, message that we are finding from the research is that gender is not equal to women. And what we mean is gender mainstreaming is about engaging both women and men. Uh, when we are innovating solutions. It's also not about counting the number of women. It's about uh, fixing the knowledge and the quality of experience that both men and women experience in the energy solutions. We are also uh, identifying as a second um, key message that how policy frames uh, gender, and in this case, how policy frames women impacts the way uh, we implement solutions. And in our case, the solutions for, for energy. And of course, energy and environment are closely linked. Uh, our research looked at different policy documents in Africa, and we found 29 documents that speak about women and they represent women in different ways. Either women as vulnerable, change agents, workforce, entrepreneurs, stakeholders, or beneficiaries. But the challenging aspect was that most of those policy documents represent women as vulnerable. How can we then conceptualize women as entrepreneurs, as leaders, as change agents, rather than just as vulnerable? I think that's a, an aspect that is coming out from emerging research. And then uh, that key message is for practical application of uh, gender mainstreaming in, in, in local levels, we need to reconceptualize the way we understand gender mainstreaming and to view it as a long-term strategy that is aimed at bridging gender awareness into the consciousness uh, and daily routines. Because gender mainstreaming has to get into our day-to-day -day, uh, or our everyday practices. And whether it is in gender, um, uh, gender-informed research methods, gender-informed policy making, or gender-informed um, stakeholder engagement processes, that needs to be taken into account in our day-to-day -day, uh, routines. And it's through that process that we can be able to provide evidence-based research by having all those processes incorporated. Thank you so much. Thanks so much, Josephine. I think, you know, your point around sometimes we, we only uh, think in terms of, you know, quantitative targets and actually it's really the quality of experiences that is important. That, that's so, I think, uh, interesting and useful for us. Let me now give the floor to the next uh, speaker, um, Veranya Chao, uh, uh, who is the program specialist on gender and climate uh, change at, at UNDP. Uh, you have a strong ex expertise on gender and environment issues, so you have the perfect panelist for this. Uh, and uh, your work has been uh, focusing on integrating gender equality and women's empowerment into national planning and capacity building uh, processes. 
Rania, please, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Romina. Uh, good afternoon or good morning, everyone. Let me first uh, thank the OECD and particularly the Environment Directorate for the invitation. It is a pleasure to be here. Um, UNDP has been supporting climate policy work at the national level under the Climate Promise Initiative, particularly in relation to the nationally determined contributions, the NDCs, revision and planning for implementation processes. So based on this experience, I believe more than ever, there is a need to mobilize resources and support the recovery of economies using integrated planning and implementation frameworks that fully acknowledge the in interconnectedness of climate change, environmental sustainability and development issues, including gender equality and women's economic empowerment and leadership. In, in fact, I would say that protecting the rights of the poorest people and communities and supporting vulnerable businesses is part of the solution to build climate resilient economies. Now, human rights centered approaches to climate finance need to be developed to fully utilize climate finance potential and produce co-benefits on gender equality and poverty uh, reduction. So, however, national experience has shown that even when countries have put gender um, and climate change capacities in place and have gender responsive data and has been collected uh, 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 these data and sectors are analyzed. A main bottleneck that remains is ensuring that planned actions are budgeted for and implemented on the ground. So a good starting point is to ensure gender responsive legal frameworks and policies and gender uh, responsive climate policy instruments such as NDCs. And it's important that these are in place. Now, for instance, 80 countries under the Climate Promise are currently reporting progress in the implementation of gender actions to inform their NDC revision process. These actions have the potential to influence country program of, of financial mechanisms, for instance, such as the Green Climate Fund and, and others, and climate programming and implementation. But I think that mostly it is necessary to design fiscal and monetary policies that consider gender dimensions and social protection mechanisms, and this was already mentioned at the beginning of the event, and that consider how climate change investments can positively impact vulnerable population groups to address structural inequalities and to remove these critical barriers. So to sustainably address these gender differentiated needs will require the full spectrum of the private, the public, and multilateral capital. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Verania. I think, uh, you know, the, your last point around the fact that, of course, the, the nexus uh, between uh, gender environment also needs to be sort of interfaced with the one, uh, you know, which uh, inequalities in envir environment is, is, uh, is very relevant. And we just published another big report on looking just at the relationship between environment and, and inequalities. And again, this is an area where uh, you know, very, very strong actions on climate change certainly is going to be beneficial for the very marginalized communities. With that, let me give the floor to Rodolfo Lassi, who is the director of the OECD Environment Directorate. And uh, Rodolfo, we are very eager to hear from you about what are the next steps, you know, what's coming up uh, as a follow-up to this very important report that we're discussing today. Well, thank you very much, uh, Romina, uh, and thank you to the previous uh, panelists uh, for their enriching uh, words. Well, despite the importance of the topic uh, as recognized by Agenda 2030 and the UN agencies, the, the OECD has only been working on the interlinkages between gender equality and environmental sustainability in earnest uh, for the last two years. So our uh, 2020 survey on integrating gender in environmental policies showed that the majority of OECD countries have some type of a strategic framework on gender equality and on um, gender mainstreaming, in particular uh, for areas such as climate change, agriculture and forestry, energy and green uh, entrepreneurship and, and jobs, no green jobs. However, there are difficulties uh, on countries approaches towards collecting gender disaggregated data. This, this is a, a big challenge, uh, data that uh, must be related to environmental policies or the environment as, as a whole topic, as a whole domain. And there are inconsistencies uh, on policy measures to ensure uh, or track gender balanced decision making related to environmental policies. So we already heard uh, uh, or, uh, earlier uh, about data gaps uh, that the publication identified very clearly. 
uh, another important aspect of the gender environment nexus is, is this consumer behavior and different men's and women's consumption patterns. Uh, earlier OECD work on, on this matter included uh, households of base dating uh, from 2018 and 2011. Uh, this survey shows that in some countries like Australia or Japan, the women are or were likely uh, to see environmental issues uh, as more pressing than men. Uh, whereas in other countries like France, where we are living, uh, men were more likely to be concerned about uh, the environment uh, in general. It also showed that uh, while men are more likely to take special measures to buy renewable energy from their electricity provider, women are more likely to engage in energy saving uh, activities such as turning off lights or energy metering uh, and shifting it to renewable energy uh, in their homes. So men uh, appear to be more familiar with energy efficiency or energy efficient labels while women have uh, an overall better knowledge of eco labels, you know, uh, these bioproducts that we see uh, in our supermarkets. Yeah, a similar study presented by the United Nations uh, shows that women consumers in OECD countries have a, a marginally more uh, environment focus or greener attitude than men concerning recycling uh, and driving less. Uh, other data shows that uh, women, for example, are more likely to recycle, minimize waste, uh, buy organic food and eco-label products, and engage uh, in water and energy savings uh, initiatives at the household level. So important thing, uh, a gender lens uh, 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 policies. So we have to really incorporate these uh, aspects uh, in our daily uh, policy making process, um, ensuring gender sensitive just transition, as Verena was saying, to low carbon economies uh, that, that can increase productivity and lead to better economic outcomes and more resilient societies. This uh, applies also to access to sustainable infrastructure and to introducing a gender lens in sustainable consumption and production partners. Patterns, sorry. Uh, as, as consumer, as, uh, women can play a central role, really a central role in the move to a circular economy. About 50% of household consumption worldwide covers food and, uh, and beverage, uh, clothing and food, footwear. Uh, <clears throat> this, is, this is very important. And also around 50% of global plastic waste generated is plastic packaging with single use plastic for food and beverage. Uh, uh, that is the, the most common. So women are considered to be the decision makers when it comes to uh, 70 to 80% of household purchases. As such, they could determine the shift to more sustainable consumption patterns and can therefore become key drivers of eco-friendly behavior. Similarly, uh, the women's wear industry, a uh, very important industry worldwide, uh, worth about 500 uh, billion uh, euros uh, in the largest uh, segment of the whole textile uh, industry. The clothing industry, of which women are the largest consumer group, uses numerous chemical substances, uh, some of which may affect the health of textile workers and also our, our own health. Uh, the above, uh, all these things that I am mentioning, are especially important points to be taken into consideration during the post-COVID-19 recovery period and all these uh, stimulus packages that we are seeing or we are classifying as, as green recovery uh, efforts. A, a green uh, and gender sensitive recovery is, is of uh, uh, utmost importance. I, I, I let me insist in this, let me emphasize in these uh, gender aspects of the green recovery efforts. Changing things requires reforms, but also a more gender balanced leadership. Even if women's representation is relatively high in environment ministries, 45%, almost 50% of environment ministries in OECD countries are women. Uh, last year, you no know, key decisions with an impact on the environment and gender equality are being taken in finance, economics, energy, industry, transport, and trade ministers, our ministries, all of them, mainly men, no? 
the men are often the, uh, the ministers. In, uh, last year, only four out of 37, this is just an example, in OECD countries had women heading uh, their government's finance portfolio. So uh, that is less than 11% uh, among OECD members. I, I leave you here, I leave this uh, topic uh, here because uh, we have uh, more, much information in the, in the document. Thank you, Romina. Thank you, Rodolfo. I think, you know, these three lines, uh, sustainable production, sustainable consumption, and certainly leadership, more gender balanced leadership, these are all areas indeed that, uh, well, already obviously very, very uh, prominently um, stressed in the report, but certainly all fields where uh, all of us uh, will be very active in the future. Okay, let me now uh, open the floor, uh, see whether there are any uh, any participant that would like to, um, I'm thinking mainly of delegations and ambassadors. I don't know whether anybody would like to intervene to make comments. Uh, otherwise, I saw that there was a question in the chat. And so perhaps I'll start by reading that, uh, that question that was addressed to Josephine. Uh, Lesha Whitmer, uh, she was asking whether the word mainstreaming is actually the most appropriate one, and, and perhaps, uh, Josephine, you would like to respond to that. Uh, and, uh, and the same participant, she was also agreeing with you on the importance that uh, uh, in the research uh, that we're doing on those issues, there is still uh, quite a lot, uh, you know, uh, from the perspective of, of victims, but not, um, or, you know, let's say, is framed from the, as being the victim and not necessarily as the actors. And so you know, we need to, to sort of uh, embed the notion of agency much, much more. Uh, Josephine, would you like to react to those comments and questions? Yes, so thank you so much, Chair Romini, and thank you for Lesha and Mapula for your comments. Uh, yes, uh, the, the term mainstreaming has got diverse interpretation and definitions. So when we look at where it began in the 1985 during the UN environment uh, meeting in Nairobi and all the way until 1995 when it became um, part of the uh, international uh, concept. Uh, it's, it's gone through different interpretations and I would think that the, the term is clouded with uh, what it really means and there are different uh, concept that indicate we need to change it to uh, maybe diversity and th this really uh, doesn't bring in the question of what is it all about yet the aspect of mainstreaming gender is about how do we bring gender equality how do we look into the the gender equalities tool where we are looking at women empowerment equal uh, equal treatment as well as the uh, gender perspective. So the question is the purpose or the aim of this aspect is more about gender equality, uh, which is the goal. And I would say that uh, it's more of looking what do we really mean by this term and how we can apply it in different context. It's been applied mainly at the international space in OECD, World Bank, um, those institutions, international labor organization at international level, international level, it's well uh, understood. Uh, but when we get into the national level, at country level, then at local level, that's where challenges begin. But then we also see that how that is defined is more about fixing the numbers or fixing the institutions. Or fixing the numbers is counting the number of women fixing the institutions is the number of women in a particular ladder or in the particular category but then the aspect of fixing the knowledge is what we are missing and i can give an example with the energy space when we look at women in uh, uh, involvement or gender uh, aspect in in the in the energy space it's at the end of the pipe and not at the energy life cycle how is women involved in the energy life cycle? If we look at the market structure or market sector of energy, how is gender incorporated in the entire market structure? And I think that's where we are missing. And we need data for that perspective. 
Thank you for the question. Uh, thank you so much, Josephine, for uh, for your answer. So I see that there are another couple of questions. I'm going to read them quickly, and I'll ask our panelists to really be be brief uh, in their uh, responses because we are approaching the end of the event. Uh, so there was a question for Chitra. Uh, you mentioned Chitra several methods uh, as part of move to integrate gender and environmental policies. Can you uh, give uh, some more details, but uh, not uh, too many because <laughs> we don't have a lot of time, but hopefully you can point uh, to some references of your work that do that. And also if you can say something around your plans and programs on uh, gender disaggregated data. Uh, and I think, yes, actually, the second question I see uh, uh, is rather a reaction to, to one of the points that uh, Josephine made. So I think we'll, we'll close it with uh, this question to Chitra, and then, uh, and then I'll take back the floor to move to the next uh, segment of this launch. Chitra, please. Yes, thank you for the opportunity to provide a few more details. So definitely the new presidential administration has put a new emphasis on um, gender equity in, in addition to all of the uh, social issues, um, equity issues. So a few things that we are gearing up to do more of, um, which builds on things we've done in the past. Um, so EPA in the past has already supported women in STEM positions and in scientific analysis. For example, we have publications covering the effects of climate change, as well as pesticides on pregnant women, of mercury on women in childbearing age. So we have been uh, collecting gender disaggregated data in our scientific analyses over time. We've also been, we have a children's health office. So we have very much are interested in the um, intersection between children and women. And then when it comes to funding, we're fortunate that we're in an era where we have some increased funding for vulnerable communities through many, throughout many of the US government programs. And we're being asked to look at uh, how we're applying that funding, where are the impacts of the funding uh, going to fall and including on increasing the, uh, the benefits to vulnerable communities, including women. Uh, in, in one of the um, programs called Justice 40. And um, in terms of gender at disaggregated data, um, you know, that is actually a really good question. We've, we do have the ability to look at it some, um, but I think with the, white, with the emphasis with the White House Gender Policy Council and um, additional work, we are constantly looking to improve on what we can do. And uh, that may be something that we take back and do more of. Great, thanks so much. I'm being told that we have another couple of minutes before we go to the uh, concluding part of the session. So let me see if uh, the other panelists would like to chip in, uh, perhaps offering a few examples uh, of the policies that work in this field, uh, anything that you would like to highlight uh, now, uh, keeping in mind that the time of discussions also we, we had with the floor and the type of interest uh, we, we just heard on. Uh, let me see who would like to go first. Linda, would you like to chip in? Uh, I can just say, well, I'm the representative of the local level, so I have some concrete examples and I'm always ready to share them afterwards also if someone's interested, but like travel habit surveys, uh, local consumer habit surveys, is something we do in Umeå and then a gender, gender segregated, of course, and then gender analysis after that. So like um, sustainable travel, 56% of women's, 42% of men's, leading to a discussion on why isn't men taking the bus and also leading to a discussion on what is the best investment, like adding on a gender perspective to understand what's the best investment, getting men to take the bus or uh, having electric buses. And uh, it's getting men to take the bus if you talk about an environmental standpoint, but then of course doing both. But just this, this nexus between gender equality and understanding the different behaviors and just looking at the investments for a more sustainable uh, city. So that's my short impasse. Thank you. Uh, perfect. Thanks so much, uh, Linda. Let me now give the floor uh, to Verania. Uh, Verania, can you very briefly tell us perhaps a couple of examples in terms of policies that really work well uh, to embrace the nexus uh, gender and climate change? Yes, sure. Uh, 
Yeah, perhaps I would like to, to share um, an example uh, that involves uh, like public pri private and it's uh, related to green mortgages because I don't think we've seen these uh, examples very often. This uh, took place in, in Uzbekistan. And uh, basically, you know, through the climate promise work and with the support and funding of the uh, GEF, which is the, the um, Global Evar Environment Facility, um, there was this pilot on green um, mortgages scheme in, in five regions in, in, in this country, and there was a partnership with a local uh, bank. And so it was interesting to see that. So the, the pilot actually, you know, resulted in 1,300 and something mortgages for low carbon affordable rural houses. Um, you know, with uh, di different uh, 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 technologies. And it was interesting to see that, you know, women were the majority of the mortgage borrowers, you know, holding 67% uh, of, of all the loans. Um, and and uh, by far surpassing, you know, the percentage that uh, of women that had participated before in the standard kind of uh, a program. So it was really interesting to see, you know, the connection between these two actions and, um, you know, the, the government of the country then actually decided, you know, to um, create uh, a scheme, you know, around this experience. Um, and then we can see, you know, the results of how, you know, this public and private capital can be invested and leveraged to support, for instance, women's empowerment and, and, and climate action at the same time. So I, I wanted just to share this because we don't see that, you know, very often the connection between these two uh, uh, practices. Thank you. No, this is very useful. And indeed, I think, you know, one of the, one of really of the objective of the conversation today is provide a platform, you know, for, for others to learn about it and, you know, possibly to, to replicate and scale up uh, this very interesting initiatives. There was another question in the chat and perhaps this is really the one, the last one I'm taking for today, which was talking about providing example, again, concrete example of how the current recovery plans that many countries are working on constitute possibilities for uh, accelerating the green transition in a way that empower women. So I'm wondering whether any of the panelists would like to take that. Rodolfo, would you like to go with this? Thank you. Yes, uh, of course. Well, uh, you know that only 17% uh, of the money that is flowing to recovery uh, packages uh, are, are green um, uh, investments on uh, sustainable projects or uh, projects that are low carbon and are increasing resilience. Uh, we are not seeing specifically uh, projects that are working in this gender environment uh, uh, Nexus, uh, especially uh, what we saw in this uh, green uh, recovery database that the OECD uh, created and launched uh, two, two weeks ago, is that th there are a, a, a huge amount of money that is going to basic water infrastructure, and in that domain, I think that uh, we can we can detect some of the possible uh, gender environment nexus uh, components that uh, are part of the of this uh, uh, basic infrastructure that we need in our houses that we need in, in our cities to really uh, improve the quality of life of our communities the, our families but with a gender perspective because the, you know that this this is a, a worldwide problem the access the accessibility of water uh, in rural communities uh, in developing countries, uh, but also the accessibility of, of water sanitation uh, uh, infrastructure uh, for women in, in general. So uh, it, it is feasible, of course, uh, to put some criteria to uh, put more emphasis in this kind of investments. On climate, uh, we, can, we can have to uh, include uh, these uh, uh, vulnerable conditions of many uh, women groups uh, that are uh, living in coastal areas and we must put more emphasis on that uh, resilient infrastructure that uh, we need uh, uh, to protect of course the women that are affected by extreme weather events for example normally they take care of the families that are affected and sometimes women are those that are reactivating the economy in the aftermath of those uh, extreme weather events. We saw that in Puerto Rico, in, in, in Central America, or in many other 
uh, African and Asian countries. Thank you so much, Rodolfo. So let me now thank all of you panelists for your great interventions. And I would like uh, to call on the Denise Garou. She is the chair of the OECD Working Party on Gender Mainstreaming and Governance. So we'll get back to this point of mainstreaming. Uh, she will provide some closing remarks. Denise, uh, you are the chairperson, as I just said, to this very important working party that was created uh, not a long time ago, but I know that this is a very active, very active working party. And you're also the director of uh, policy and external relations uh, branch, women and gender equality, of course, uh, in Canada. Denise, the floor is yours. Well, hello, everybody. And thank you so much uh, for that kind introduction, Romania. Um, well, as uh, Romania was saying, I'm here. Um, representing the Working Party on Gender Mainstreaming and Governance. But if you'll indulge me just for a moment, um, I'd like to take a, a minute to promote a practice that we've adopted in Canada, which is referred to as a territorial or land acknowledgement. It's rooted in ancient indigenous diplomatic custom. And it's a practice where um, we're it's being revived for meetings and events to acknowledge the indigenous nation or nations that occupy the territory uh, where a meeting's taking place. So providing a land acknowledgement, it, it simply involves thinking about what happened in the past and what changes can be made going forward to further the reconciliation reconciliation process. Um, so we do this to reaffirm our commitment and responsibility in improving relationships um, and improving our own understanding of Indigenous peoples and their culture. So while we meet today on a virtual platform, I'm joining you uh, from Canada's capital city, Ottawa, which is the traditional unceded territory of the Algonquin uh, Anishinaabe people. So you might like to take a moment yourselves just to reflect on the lands and the people that have made it possible for, for you to be here today. So I'm really, really delighted to be um, able to join you and, and I've uh, had the opportunity to listen to uh, these interventions and um, what a thought provoking session uh, this has been. So the work that the OECD has done over the past few years has definitely contributed to some real progress in this area. But uh, there remains, uh, you know, this remains new terrain um, and there continues to be opportunities for improvement. So today's publication, uh, let me congratulate you on the publication of uh, the gender and the environment, building evidence base and policies to achieve the SDGs. It's a unique resource. It's, going, it's providing comparative information and evidence-based analysis on the gender and environment nexus. And it applies an integrated policy framework accounting for both inclusion and environmental considerations at the national and international level. So as you know, I have the, the pleasure of serving as the chair of the OECD Working Party uh, on gender mainstreaming and governance. And in that capacity, I have the opportunity to speak to experts from different technical areas um, across the OECD and consider and um, together how uh, we might leverage mainstreaming approaches into various functional areas so that they become instruments to advance equality and reduce negative impacts on certain populations. But to be done meaningfully, technical experts uh, need to be versed in mainstreaming and in gender equality and inclusion related issues more generally. Um, I uh, and the Working Party would be pleased to work with you to explore areas for mutually reinforcing work, in particular in supporting you and the efforts of this committee in the systematic inclusion of gendered and inclusion perspectives in all aspects of your work. So mainstreaming gender and equality perspectives is the process of assessing the implications for different groups of women, men, and gender diverse people in any planned action including legislation, policies, or programs um, in any area uh, and at all levels. It's a strategy for making these considerations an integral dimension of all the work you do. 
Effective mainstreaming is best done by groups that are diverse, so that work is in, informed by diverse perspectives. It's participative and citizen focused in its design. Lived experience and qualitative data are integral part of the process. However, because mainstreaming is about identifying and closing gaps between groups of men, women, and gender diverse people, it requires quality disaggregated data and it needs to be usable by people with limited statistical expertise. Only with um, qualitative, uh, pardon me, only with quantitative data will countries be positioned to show with evidence that gender and equality issues matter in environmental policy. It's also important that data be available for different regions. That is because socially constructed concepts like gender and the relationship between gender equality issues and the environment will manifest themselves differently in different contexts. While context specific data is important, there's room, there's room for collective action. For example, we could develop frameworks, indicators and guidance that member countries and their regions can draw from and adapt to their context. The nexus approach you describe in your newly launched publication can drive us towards more comprehensive platforms for action. It can support a broader framing of mainstreaming methodology, one that is connected to other priorities, including those related to the environment. A number of countries are increasingly um, moving towards intersectional focuses in their mainstreaming approaches, not only as it relates to the intersections between these transversal policy areas, such as the environment and gender equality, but also considerations of other um, individual level factors, such as race, age, income, um, and different contexts, including group membership, social contexts, and systems of oppression. Gender mainstreaming in environmental policies, policies can help increase understanding and subsequently address environmental impacts on various segments of society and create more equal opportunities for all in more sustainable economies. In Canada, the Impact Assessment Act, which was updated in 2019, is designed to protect the environment, but also requires that development projects be assessed for economic, <coughs> social, and health impacts. The legislation requires consideration of the intersections of sex and gender with other identities, such as geographic location, educational um, attainment, disability, to name but a few. The legislation is served to advance the assessment of gender and environment considerations together. Continuing to understand the interlinkages between gender equality and environmental su sustainability is imperative to achieve environmental, economic, and inclusiveness goals. So I'll leave it there and thank you so much once again for inviting me here today. And I'd like to emphasize that the GMG is having strategic discussions now on how uh, to engage with bodies um, across the OECD. And we'd welcome future collaboration with the Environment Directorate to work together and um, advance uh, our common objectives. Thank you. Thank you so much, Denise, for your inspiring remarks and also for sharing with us this very beautiful uh, practice of the, the territorial and land acknowledgement. I, I think we'll try to commit to actually do it every time from now onwards. Uh, we are delighted to hear uh, not only the great progress that you have done in the Working Party, but also, of course, in Canada. And uh, certainly, I'm sure that uh, all of us uh, are really keen on collaborating further, further, and so certainly bringing together the efforts, uh, you know, of these various committees going forward. Thank you again for that. Uh, I am delighted now to give the floor to our uh, final speaker, uh, who is our Deputy uh, Secretary General, uh, Mr. Masamichi Kono, for uh, the closing remarks of this session today. DSG Kono, the floor is yours. Thank you, Romina. Um, Your Excellencies, uh, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, um, this has been a truly stimulating, uh, inspiring discussion, um, and it has really shown how, how, how tightly linked are um, the issue of uh, gender equality and uh, environmental sustainability. Um, and uh, in fact, uh, um, I would like to first, of course, thank uh, our distinguished guests and speakers, uh, and also our hardworking uh, colleagues 
uh, both um, in the Secretariat and in um, delegations and in governments, um, for the uh, um, uh, for first of all making this happen, uh, that is uh, to be able to launch this uh, um, uh, um, excellent report, and also of course to have a, um, um, a great discussion around uh, that uh, report today. Now, um, at the OECD. Um, we are certainly um, uh, planning ahead and um, this COVID crisis um, has really um, in our eyes um, exposed uh, the vulnerabilities uh, of our economies and societies and the challenges of um, um, in the environment, uh, biodiversity and climate change. Um, uh, they have already been um, uh, now uh, discussed uh, so that we can actually um, somehow realize a truly uh, um, resilient, inclusive, and uh, sustainable uh, green recovery. And um, the needs and the role of uh, um, women and uh, girls should be at the forefront of those debates. Um, and at the upcoming annual uh, Ministerial Council meeting of the OECD, OECD countries uh, will be invited to discuss how the economic stimulus packages and recovery plans that governments are putting in place uh, or have been executing have the uh, potential to create a recovery that is uh, truly um, green and inclusive. Um, I may pick those two words. Um, now, um, and uh, as uh, Rodolfo or Mr. Lassi actually mentioned, uh, recent OECD analysis has shown that while governments are actively promoting the agenda for a green recovery, uh, much more ambition is needed. And um, um, certainly um, uh, using a gender lens and considering the needs of vulnerable groups um, in recovery plans will be essential to make sure that the recovery leaves no one behind. And during this uh, um, uh, upcoming ministerial meeting, the, the OECD will report on the development of a dashboard of indicators to monitor progress towards a, um, uh, again, a strong, resilient, green and inclusive recovery. Um, now, um, we can see that there is growing momentum to advance this work and including at the OECD. Um, and just before this event, we had a meeting uh, with a group of ambassadors to the OECD, uh, a group called the Friends of Gender Equality Plus. And um, uh, we uh, did a stock take of the progress made in um, gender mainstreaming in uh, OECD work uh, in all areas. And in this context, um, actually, uh, this report that uh, we launched today is a great example of how we can support countries in mainstreaming gender. It is about showing the uh, different, uh, differential environmental impacts on women and men. It's about uh, addressing uh, various intersecting challenges uh, uh, by uh, and uh, um, also um, uh, by applying uh, an integrated policy approach to, to, um, to tackle uh, those challenges. And um, I should also uh, uh, emphasize that it is about strengthening the evidence base and data collection that would allow the OECD to further support countries in their efforts. Now, um, uh, on the takeaways uh, from this discussion, I don't want to uh, try to summarize uh, the, the extremely rich uh, discussion that you had. Um, I think uh, you will uh, all have your own takeaways. Um, I would just mention maybe a few points that I picked up, which I think are quite important. That uh, is um, environmental justice really brings together the uh, social and economic dimensions of sustainable development and women must be a driving force behind achieving environmental justice and um, there was also a reference to um, uh, innovation uh, in, in this context and um, gender equality and environmental sustainability are indeed mutually reinforcing uh, but then um, to make this happen we need um, um, uh, the correct uh, um, uh, behavioral change the uh, 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 the correct policies to make that happen. And um, in all this, uh, women's leadership and equal participation could uh, really help us move forward um, and uh, um, uh, make progress. Now, when we talk about an integrated policy framework, um, it should uh, normally mean that in its design and implementation, um, um, policies in all, area, all areas must be supportive of the uh, um, uh, 
gender environment nexus agenda, and um, that um, uh, planned action must be implemented, uh, not just talked about. And um, gender sensitive climate finance uh, should also improve uh, gender equality uh, and create um, uh, opportunities for women and men uh, and help meet the SDGs and the Paris Agreement. But we do need um, much more effort, much more um, uh, innovative uh, uh, means of uh, making this happen again. And developing uh, gender environment indicators, enhancing data collection, um, uh, if I may repeat, uh, this would really support uh, women as um, uh, positive agents of change or agents of positive change. And um, um, this may be a point uh, on which the OECD can further um, uh, delve into and uh, provide uh, a better support uh, to countries uh, um, uh, again uh, um, uh, and providing in providing evidence-based solutions that are needed. So um, uh, maybe I should stop here. And again, um, my great thanks to all of you for um, uh, participating today. And uh, certainly this is not the end. This is only a beginning of our discussion. Please stay tuned. And uh, uh, we really look forward to seeing you again soon. And um, of course, uh, all the best uh, in this um, very difficult period. Thank you so much. Thank you, DST Kono. Um, thank you, everyone, uh, for uh, this um, uh, for for staying tuned to to this launch event. Thank you all the, to all the speakers and panelists, and thank you uh, thanks to everyone who joined in and listened to this presentation. And um, as the DSG Kono said, uh, looking forward to meeting up again with you soon and discussing further uh, specific thematic topics on the gender and environment nexus. Thank you again. Goodbye. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. All the best.